Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back again to the program and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this series. Uh, we, we probably have a few more programs yet to go. We just finished two uh, TV programs dealing with the prison gate. And what we've been doing is teaching this series from the book of Nehemiah, Ezra, Zechariah, Haggai, concerning the roadmap to Reformation. And we've been teaching uh, how I believe each piece of what was pictured in Ezra and Nehemiah is a picture of what Jesus Himself began to lead as far as They were building a physical temple in Ezra's day, and Jesus declared His body was the temple, and then Paul further declares that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If we're in Christ, He's in us. We are the temple of God. We're the new temple. That began with Jesus, and uh, not only did Jesus declare uh, concerning the temple, but He started declaring something concerning a people becoming a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And we I'm not going to go back and review a lot concerning the city of God, because we even talked about it last week a little bit in that uh, text where we are talking about Isaiah 53 when he said, Sing, O barren, is he was literally talking to, uh, I mean, that was, a, that was a verse of Scripture that's actually quoted in Galatians chapter number 4, when he declares that these two women are two covenants, one of them is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and let me let me go back and, and read it. We we talked a little bit about it, but I'm going to come back here and just read it again uh, to kind of help get a little bit of clarity on this. It says, "Tell me, you who are bent on being under the law, do you not listen to what the law really says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman." Hagar, and one by the free woman, that's Sarah. But the child of the slave woman was born according to the flesh and had an ordinary birth, while the son of the free woman was born in fulfillment of the promise. Now these facts are used, these facts are about to be used by me, Paul is saying, as an allegory, that is an illustration by using them. For these these women can represent two covenants. One covenant originated from Mount Sinai, where the law was given, that bears children destined for slavery, she is Hagar. Now Hagar is and represents Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem. So he's telling you that the present natural Jerusalem is Mount Sinai, its old covenant Jerusalem in Arabia, and she's Hagar. Now that's interesting to me. That's not my words, that's the words of the Apostle Paul. Now Hagar is and represents Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. That's Old Covenant Jerusalem. But the Jerusalem that's above, that is the way of faith, represented by Sarah, is free. Uh, uh, The Amplified Classic says the Messianic Kingdom of Christ is the Jerusalem which is above. Now we're talking about uh, an old Jerusalem fading away, and a new Jerusalem coming on the scene, which is the new covenant people of God. So if we're restoring a temple and we're restoring the city of God, we must see that he's not talking about a location geographically, but a people, a new covenant people. And last week when we were talking about the prison gate, we were talking about how they literally correspond to the bondage of an old covenant. He was delivered to prison so you and I could be set free in one of his first public messages, Jesus said He came to set the captives free, to release us from the slavery of a system that made slaves out of us and not sons. And last week I talked about that adoption in the former parts of Galatians 4 and the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body was being placed into the new covenant and moved out of the old covenant and being placed, the adoption there, as sons into the new covenant. But he goes on to say, but the Jerusalem above, that is the way of faith, represented by Sarah, is free. She is our mother, for it is written in the Scripture, Rejoice, O barren woman, who has not given birth, and break forth into a joyful shout, 
you who are not in labor. For the desolate woman has many more children than she who has a husband. That is a direct quote from Isaiah 54. When we followed through Isaiah 53, we talked about how he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement so you could have peace was laid on him. By his stripes you were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've gone everyone into his own path. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And, he, you know, we talked about how he was delivered to prison. And, uh, you know, and, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, all of the stuff that he describes in the redemptive work of Isaiah 53. And then he starts in Isaiah 54 and he says, sing, O barren. That's the very, what he's saying is, listen, you have moved into a new covenant paradigm. You've been delivered from the bondage of this old covenant through the person and work of Jesus Christ and his redemptive work to redeem you from the curse of the law. You've been redeemed not just from sin, but from the curse of the law that the people called on themselves. But the reality of it is, is that when he says, sing, O barren, Paul the apostle grabs that and talks about us being placed into this, uh, this, this adoption, uh, which uh, the word adoption there doesn't mean you take somebody else's child and adopt it. It means to be placed as a full-grown son. We athesi, I believe, is the Greek word for it. And we're placed into the in, in, we're placed into the new covenant, not under governors and tutors, which he described as being the old covenant bondage, and coming into this glorious listen, this glorious liberty that Paul talked about in Galatians. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. No longer to be enslaved in the yoke of slavery. And we used to think I used to preach a thing. Well, he's talking about the world slavery. No, no, he's talking about religious bondage. The whole book of Galatians is about moving from law to grace. It's about moving from being in the flesh to being in the Spirit and being governed by the Spirit of God. And that's the whole thrust of the whole entire book of Galatians. And then when he gets into chapter 4, he starts saying, listen, uh, sing, O barren. And so he's connecting this sing, O barren, and you who did not uh, bring forth children, he's saying you're about to bring forth uh, 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 you're about to bring forth something. And, and can I tell you that he talks about even how uh, the, the child of the bondwoman, Ishmael, persecuted the son of the free woman. It is amazing to me the persecution that we receive most of the time. These apostles in the first century received more persecution from the religious people than they, I mean, they received persecution, of course, from the Romans in, in cooperation with the Jewish synagogues and the Judaizers, and they were literally, uh, you know, they were some of the worst ones pursuing them. But, you know, see, the reason I think that the son of the bondwoman mocks and makes fun of the son of the free woman is because they're jealous of your liberty and your freedom. Now, I'm not talking about going out here and doing stuff that's wrong. I'm, I'm talking about being able to live in freedom out of a new nature and out of a new covenant with the Holy Spirit being your governor and being governed and led by the Spirit as sons and daughters of God. But they that are led by the Spirit are sons of God. What's the contrast? We were used to be led by the flesh or by the rules, and now we're led by the Spirit. We're sons of God. But he goes on to say here that, uh, that those of us, we believing brothers, verse 28, and sisters, like Isaac, our children, not merely by a physical or natural descent like Ishmael, but our children born of promise, born miraculously, those of us who are born again. But as at that time, the child of the ordinary birth, born according to the flesh, persecuted the son who was born according to the promise and the working of the spirit, so it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman, Hagar, and her son Ishmael, for never shall the son of the bondwoman be heir and share in the inheritance with the son of the free woman. So then believers, we who are born again, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for His purpose, are not children of a slave woman, the natural, but the free woman, the supernatural. And then he comes into the next chapter and talks about it, it was for freedom, that Christ set us free, completely liberating us, 
Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery, which you once removed. Now, he's talking about removing them from the law. Notice it is I, Paul, who tells you that if you receive circumcision as a supposed requirement of salvation, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You will lack the faith in Christ that is necessary for salvation. Once more, I solemnly affirm to every man who receives circumcision as a supposed requirement of salvation that he is under obligation and required to keep the whole law, and you have been severed from Christ if you seek to be justified, that is declared to be free of guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing with God through the law. For you have fallen from grace. For if you have lost your grasp on God's unmerited blessing and favor... See, falling from grace does not mean you sinned on Saturday night. It means you went back up under the law and you seek to be justified and declared righteous on the basis of the law. And he said, what has happened? If you go back to circumcision and you go back to this performance base seeking to be justified by the law, then you are in debt to do the whole law and you have fallen from grace. I'm talking about the prison gate and being set free into this glorious liberty. And when he starts to use that scripture again, uh, from the, the, the text that I read from you in Isaiah, uh, he, he declares on down through there, as you go down through there, he says, for this is as the waters of Noah to me. And I thought, well, how, why would he put that in the midst of this whole context? Well, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. You know, by whose stripes we are healed, single bearing you that did not bring forth because you're about to bring forth and stretch forth the curtains of your tent, large the place of your dwelling, because I think what he's declaring is it's going to include both Jew and Gentile. And he starts talking about for a small moment, I hid my face from you. And, and he goes on to talk about, but he said, but this is as the waters of Noah to me. And as I thought about this, uh, is as the waters of Noah to me, I, I, I started thinking how God pictured or God, how God viewed the redemptive work of Jesus in Isaiah 53. How he literally viewed, he was wounded for my transgression. He was, how does that fit to this is as the waters of Noah to me? Of course, I think as you look at the gospel, not the gospel, but the epistle of Peter, he talks about Noah being a picture of water baptism. And that, that it, was, it was like uh, where baptism doth now save us. He was talking about water baptism. And so I thought, well, how is this a picture of this is as the waters of Noah to me? And the Lord began to just, you know, I've, I've shared this in, all over the world. But God so viewed the ark of the ark of Noah as a picture of the redemptive work of Christ. Watch this. This ark is a picture of a vehicle that will take you out of an old world dominated by sin and by the curse and bring you into a new world where the curse has been reversed. This ark was made from gopher wood because if you're going to get a vehicle out of an old world dominated by the sin of the curse, you're going to have to involve a tree. I mean, Jesus was crucified on a tree. The ark, he said, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. The Hebrew word for pitch there is the Hebrew word kephar, and it is the same word we translate atonement other places in the scriptures. So what he's saying is what seals you in to this ark called Christ is the atoning blood of Jesus seals you in and it seals out the world. And Christ, who is our ark, becomes the vehicle out of an old world dominated by sin and by the curse because we did not escape the judgment. We were in the thing that the judgment fell on when we were in Christ on Calvary's tree, we're going to probably somewhere get to the Mifkad gate or to the uh, inspection gate, which is sometimes simultaneously connected to the prison gate. It's like a little bit of confusion as which gate this is. But at that uh, Mifkad gate, it's talking about the place of, of gathering and it's talking about the place of, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of, of being inspected. So we were inside of this ark called Christ. 
And this sacrifice of Jesus I showed you in a prior one was already, He was inspected so that God was not inspecting us, He was inspecting the ark. But what the ark was is a picture of the judgment of God falling on that ark, but we were inside of that vehicle that the ark, that the judgment was falling on, so that when the waters begin to arise, it was carrying us out of a world dominated by sin and by the curse. The, the, the dimensions of this ark are 30 cubits, which is the number of the blood of Christ. That's the number, it was 50 cubits high, I believe it was 50 cubits wide. By the number 50 is the number of Pentecost. So you can see 30 is the blood of Jesus, blood bought, 50 the number of Pentecost, spirit filled by 300 cubits long, which is the number of divine completeness. So we get in a boat called Christ, we get bought by the blood, we get filled with the Holy Ghost, and we start to move towards maturity and completeness. There are three levels to the ark. If I could say it like this, there is Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. A lot of stuff could be said here. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. All of that speaks of the progress and progression of redemption. But here's one of the things I'm after is, the Scripture tells us that that ark takes off and it lands on a mountain called Ararat. When it lands on the mountain of Ararat in the seventh month, the 21st day of the month, which is during the Feast of Tabernacles, and later on in history would be the month of the Feast of Tabernacles, it lands on a mountain called Ararat, and the word Ararat means the curse has been reversed. And so we get off of the ark in a new world where God renews the mandate, have dominion, subdue, and be fruitful and multiply. That was the mandate that God gave to Noah. He lets two birds go out of the ark. One flies all the way through the Scriptures, lands in the book of Revelation, where Babylon has become the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. But the dove only has to fly to the book of Matthew, where it finds Jesus, the real ark, emerging from the waters of baptism of John the Baptist, and the dove landed on Jesus. And what the dove said to John, basically in picture form, is right here is the olive branch of the new, and right here is the new world. This is the covenant of peace, and this is the place where the redemption has taken place. And when you go down through uh, this whole uh, thing where Paul was talking about uh, the freedom that is in Christ, he is talking about a liberty and a freedom from a bondage. Now, uh, I, I don't know how much time I've got to get into this Mifkat gate a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and start with this a little bit. We kind of uh, are bleeding this over from the uh, the prison gate, but in, in, it goes on to talk about, here's the last gate mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. It's the last gate. It said, After him, Malchijah and one of the goldsmith made repairs as far as the house of the Nethanim, and of the merchants in front of the Mithcad gate, and as far as the upper room at the corner, and between the upper room at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. The final gate is called the Mithcad gate. It is also called the gate of inspection. It is also called sometimes the prison gate, or the muster gate, or the gate of gathering. Uh, there's so many things that I, I, I could say here, but I, want, I, I will say this concerning... Uh, concerning the inspection gate, is that the book of Corinthians, where it talks about, in, in uh, let me see if I can just pull that up real quick here out of my notes, uh, but when it's talking about, uh, let me just find it here in Corinthians, I believe it is, uh, let me see if I can find it real quickly here, in, in the book of Corinthians, where he's talking about He's talking about uh, the communion table. Uh, let me, let, I just, let me, let me just talk about it. That way, I don't have to search for it here in my notes. But he's talking about the table of communion, and he says to them, uh, as he says, as I have received of the Lord, that the same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said to them. This is my body, which was broken 
for you. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you come together. And he goes on to tell them, For if you eat and drink of the body and blood of the Lord unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to your soul. So let a man, watch this, examine himself. And then the scripture says, And so let him eat. And what I, because he said, if you eat and drink of the body and the blood of the Lord unworthily, not discerning the Lord's body, you eat and drink damnation to your soul. Now there's a lot that could be said here because one of the things that Paul is doing is rebuking them for having a better place for the upper class people and segregating themselves among the love feast. But I think also what we've done with the table of communion, which really was a table designed to be inclusive, we've made it exclusive and said, if you're not a glow-in-the-dark, holier-than-thou, white-robed Christian, you better not eat this communion cracker or drink this juice or you are going to die and go to hell. And I can remember when that stuff was preached, we would have an hour altar service before we would have communion for fear of taking that that, that, that body and blood of the Lord unworthily and for fear of dying and going to hell. And I can remember as a leader thinking to myself, I'm going to skip this service because it's not worth it for a shot of grape juice and a piece of bread. Thinking to myself, because I don't know of anything the particular in my life that's sin, but I, it's just not worth the risk. And what we've done with communion is we've made it about disqualifying people. But you've got to remember that the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gave that communion bite to Judas who would betray him. He gave it to Peter who he said, before the rooster crows, dude, you are going to betray me. And the reality of it is, is he gave it to his betrayers, if you will, people who are unworthy. Because if you eat what he's saying, when he took that bread and that, that wine, he, he broke the bread. He said, this is my body. It was broken for you. I don't know if I'm communicating this well or not, but I'm going to say it from Isaiah 53 again. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. He was rejected so that you could be accepted. He was disqualified so you could be qualified. He took your sickness so you could be healed. He took your prison so you could get freedom. He took your beating so you could get peace. He took your stripes so you could get healed. He took what you had coming so you could get what He has coming. So when I think about eating and drinking of the body and the blood of the Lord unworthily, I think about what happens is you're examining the wrong thing at the gate of inspection. Because if you're examining you, you're examining the wrong thing. And if you remember two or three segments ago, I talked about that when the sin offering would come, the sinner would lay his hand on the head of the lamb, the priest would take the lamb and inspect the lamb, but the sinner was never examined. So here's what happens. We examine ourselves on the basis of what Jesus did for us to qualify us. Because he said, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. In other words, I have examined myself and deemed that I am worthy. I'm not going to eat it in an unworthy manner because it's, it's what he did in his redemptive work that actually made me worthy to be able to be a partaker of what's on the table of this new covenant. The new covenant was inaugurated that night when Jesus said, with great desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you, because Jesus knew that would be the final time they would ever have to kill another woolly lamb and eat a physical Passover, because tomorrow He would be the ultimate Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. If we could just embrace it by grace and sing, O barren, we could come out of the prison house of our bondage and enter into this glorious liberty that I'm talking about and see that this was as the waters of Noah to God and that He's seen all of the judgment as being fulfilled. Therefore, I can come to the table not in an unworthy manner, but as one qualified and invited to the table. You know, it's amazing to me, even throughout the Scriptures in the book of Leviticus, he tells them that if you have a flat nose or a club foot or a hunchback or you're a dwarf or a running sewer, you are disqualified from eating the bread of your God. 
But in the New Testament, Jesus handpicks every one of those things that was disqualified in the book of Leviticus and heals it in the New Testament. He finds a woman bowed to the earth. She's the crookback. He finds a dwarf, Zacchaeus, in a tree. He finds a man with a running sore, the lepers. He finds a man with a blinded eye, that's blind Bartimaeus. And he heals all of those that were disqualified under the old covenant. And then he ends that story by saying, he starts talking about um, making a great feast and bidding many, and many would not come. So he said, go out into the highways and the hedges and invite the halt, the lame, and the blind and tell them to come to my table. What I'm trying to tell you is you are qualified on the basis of what Jesus did at this prison gate or possibly even the Mifkad gate. And this was the gate of inspection. And the inspection that's already been taking place is we've expect, we have ex inspected the lamb and we have deemed that it's a spotless lamb and that it was the ultimate sacrifice. And as we examine ourselves, we find out that we are examining ourselves so that we can eat from the table because it's what's on the table that delivers you. You know, trying to disqualify people from the table of the Lord is what keeps them from the very thing that can help them. The thing that delivered the children from, of Israel from Egyptian bondage was they took a lamb in the house, ate it in the night, roast with fire the head, the legs, the pertinent thereof. And what they fed on was what gave them the strength and the power to leave the bondage they were in. So when I think of, of eating at the covenant table and inspecting and being inspected and Him being inspected and then us inspecting ourselves so that we could eat, it's what we feed on except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, Jesus said. You don't have any life in you. So if it takes that to get us to have this life, but we can't have life without that. It's like an oxymoron. So what I'm simply saying is, is this scripture is not to disqualify you. And this inspection is not to inspect sinners. This inspection is to expect the perfect Lamb of God and let you see that you're qualified and accepted in the Beloved so that you can come to the table of God and feed on the new covenant. We're about out of time again in this segment. I trust you're enjoying this series. And if you would like to partner with us to help us to take the gospel like this around the world, please go to our website. It's the very easiest way to do it and give via credit card or, or a debit card or PayPal. You can do it through the PayPal account. It's very secure. Or you call the number on the screen. Someone will take your call. Or you can send a check or a money order to the address that will come up on the screen. We do deeply appreciate your help. And it takes your faithful partnership to be able to do this on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance. And God bless you for doing that. Thank you. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.